is improbability on top of implausibility on top of impossibility. Just absurd from beginning to end, I'm sorry. My name is Dave McComey. I'm a professional safe cracker. I've been in the business since 1972. I've written 24 technical manuals on safes and vaults and one memoir called Safe Cracker. I run an international organization of professional safe crackers and have since 1992. Lock picking and safe cracking are two very different things. We're not going to see anybody picking a padlock with a hairpin today. This scene is from Army of Thieves. He does it in eight seconds. That's fun and great on screen, but it's a total fabrication. The fastest time ever recorded by a professional in the annual manipulation contest is three minutes, 57 seconds. That's quite a bit more. And I believe that record was about 30 years ago. The manufacturers were horribly embarrassed and they tightened up their tolerances and the times in subsequent years ballooned up to 20, 30, 40 minutes or more. Army of Thieves isn't technically accurate, but it is beautifully done. You know, the number of dials on these vaults is a, a little bit unrealistic. The overwhelming majority of bank vaults have two dials, two locks. Safe cracking competitions are a real thing. We have an annual manipulation contest and we crown a new winner every year. They're different in real life. Uh, we use practice mounts like this. We don't use whole safes. Years ago, there was uh, a lot of hooting and hawing. We, we had a lot of fun with it. These days, it's, it's a little more subdued. Left for the semifinals. Fireball, Valiant, Neo, and Mr. Nervous Guy. I loved it when the MC called him Mr. Nervous Guy. Well, that's me. I get nervous before every super hard job. Sebastian beautifully captures the mindset, the passion of a young safe cracker just bitten badly by the safe and vault bug. Nice little touch to have the guy who won the first two competitions use a an amplifier, you'll see him stick a device like this on the vault and slip in an earpiece. The amplifier helps us hear what's going on in that lock much better than we can just by touch alone, especially if things are spongy inside the lock. My only criticism of Army of Thieves would be that Dieter should have been looking at the dial. He's looking away and he's just sensing. They're leading you to believe that through touch alone, you can open a lock. And while there are rare cases where that is true, absolutely not true in any of these vaults, you would have to use your eyes. The realistic version of manipulation is watching for contact points to change on the dial. Contact points are either side of the drive cam gate bumping against the fence. These are the contact points where the lever nose is bumping on either side of the drive cam gate. And here are what the contact points look like on the other side. And we notice those on the dial, right down to the 10th of a digit. This is our lever and our fence. Our gates are up here. When the gates are properly aligned, our fence drops in and the lock bolt retracts. This lock is now open. Manipulation is the most boring thing on screen to watch. It's just a person turning the dial back and forth and back and forth. The way Army of Thieves did it, with the young manipulator able to feel out the actual numbers of the combination, it's much more dramatic and fun to watch. This scene is from The Italian Job. This scene started off being preposterous. The safe fell several stories into the water. 
where Donald Sutherland manipulated it open. I was in initially skeptical. I thought, mm, I don't know. So I took a mounted lock and I put it in my tub underwater. I was surprised I could feel the contact points, no problem. Where I think it might give Donald greater difficulty would be in the murky water. Remember, actual manipulation isn't just touch. You've got to be able to see with your eyes. The indications we're looking for are so tiny. You just have to have a crystal clear view of that dial and the numbers, or there's no way that you can tell the difference. What I mean is quite literally, there's five, there's 5.1, 5.2, 5.3, 5.4, 5.5, 5.6, 5.7, 5.8, 5.9, 5.10, 5.11, 5.12, 5.13, 5.14, 5.15, 5.16, 5.17, 5.18, 5.19, 5.
Well, the setup here is fantastic. I love that they have one lady manipulating and one lady grilling. And isn't that the guy from Squid Game? Uh, in the first place, she knows the safe has a glass plate in it. We don't want to break the glass plate because off go the relockers. So what does she do? Well, she drills a hole to put in a wire with a hook on the end, and she's gonna grab the cable. She did attack the door, which I wouldn't have done. I would have gone through the side or through the top into the door pan and scoped the lock open and never touched the glass. But that would have been a much less interesting opening than what she pulled off. I like that she's using a very high-end articulating flexible scope. She's using an Everest, and you'll see the little tip. She's controlling it. It's a real tool, it really does exist, and it makes a safe cracker's life much easier. The industry standard version of this doesn't have an articulating tip, but it's nice to be able to move it around inside a safe. Scopes are the most expensive component of any safe cracker's arsenal. If I had to replace all of my scopes, it would be over $100,000. Ties it off to a chair. Okay, that's goofy, but it works. They've changed a few things inside the safe. That's not the stock safe that you would buy. If you were to do what she does and drill at those locations on that safe, you wouldn't open it. But this doctored safe is probably the closest to reality I've ever seen, but what she did wouldn't actually work. All the tools and the techniques that she used were 100% real. The only difference here would be she's using a pneumatic drill. It's a little bitty low torque motor. In the real world, I don't know anybody that uses pneumatics to open safes. We use high powered, high torque electric motors. The job of any drill motor is to turn the drill bit and a high torque electric motor does a much better job than a low torque pneumatic. As to why they have one lady safe cracker manipulating and the other one drilling, I don't know. To see them in competition with each other was just fascinating in this film. And I'm kind of glad the driller won. I tend to favor drilling over manipulation these days. Uh, it's just faster. This scene is from the score. You'd want to be careful with a burning bar, especially on a cut like that, because once the flame pops through into the safe, it's going to destroy anything in its path. That's where the diamonds are or whatever the goodies are. And cash, of course, is going up in flames. The burning bar came out in a portable version in the 1980s. Many of us professionals were all over it. I used one for many years until I burned up a pile of money at an Albertson store in Hillsboro, Oregon. I haven't used it since. The burning bar, it's for underwater demolition, where the illegal amateurs use it to chop big holes and things. We use it just to get through a tiny hole through hard plate, and it works well for that. And the tip, by the way, it burns uh, north of 8,000 degrees. The interesting thing here is that this attack is real. Decades ago, safes in the northeastern United States were attacked with what came to be known as the water bomb. Drill a hole in the top, seal the safe so it's waterproof, fill it with water, put a charge in there and detonate. Boom, that force has to go somewhere, and that is the door being blown across the room. It was used for several summers in a row and never again. Some people speculate it was MIT grad students, who knows. It's an iconic method, even though we would never use it. Professional safe crackers are not fans of brute force methods that cause extensive damage. Our clients want to reuse the safe once we get it open and repaired. There's no repairing a safe that's been water bombed. Hollywood very much likes the brute force method. It looks great on screen. The iconic scenes would probably be Thunderbolt and Lightfoot, also a real story. 
Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, where they used a little bit too much dynamite. Cradle to the grave. There's no chance this would work. It's silly. In Ant-Man, Paul Rudd uses water and liquid nitrogen to blow the vault door off. And for a few dollars more, they use acid down the keyway to open the key lock. And it actually was a method that was used. Manufacturers had to respond by putting holes in their key locks, usually on the bottom and in the back, so that acid or gunpowder would simply run out of the lock. Amateur attacks run the gamut, but they usually focus on the visible things on the front of a safe or a vault. They'll cut the hinges, they'll knock the dial off, knock the handle off, damage that does not have any chance of opening a real safe. It just locks it up even tighter. And we have to come behind them as professionals and clean up their mess. That's the real world. This is a scene from Thief. This is quite realistic with real safecracker tools. It was one of the first really good safecracker films. Here he's using a real magnetic drill press made by Milwaukee. I've used the same make and model myself. Uh, it's quite heavy. We still use magnetic drill presses today, but the ones we use are much lighter, much smaller. The advantage of a drill press or any fixed rig is that it keeps your hole nice and straight, which is important. If your target is far away, uh, you don't want to miss. What Khan has different here is he's using an enormous bit. It's gotta be an inch and a quarter or so. No pro safe cracker would ever draw a hole that big, except in extremely rare circumstances. Certainly this isn't that. Where he drills this enormous hole, we wouldn't drill there. You see tumblers. Well, you wouldn't see tumblers on the actual safe if you drilled there, but let's assume that you did. A pro safe cracker at this point would line up those notches. What does Khan do? He sticks a punch in the hole and he knocks those wheels into the safe. That's a Mosler cast iron fire safe, a double door. Chances are very good it has the number 10 lock in it. And if you punch the wheels out on a number 10, you just fired a relocker. Not good. Realistically, he wouldn't have gotten that safe open, at least not using the technique that he did. Here's a scene from Fast Five. When they pulled out a modular vault, I was shocked. I expected it to be a vault made of concrete walls. Most of the vaults like that are made of poured concrete. Very odd for a vault that large to come out the way it did. First thing that would have broken would have been the little bolt heads holding the brackets on that are holding the bar on that they attach to. And then those two little sports cars are gonna fling this thing around downtown Rio de Janeiro like a battering ram. The door alone probably weighs between 10 and 12 tons. You stack the rest of the room on top of that, there's zero chance those little cars could drag that thing. It's not on wheels. I don't care how supercharged they are, it's impossible. And they end up in a warehouse where the battering ram is pristine. This is preposterous. And then on the door is this high-tech thingamabob that we're supposed to believe is a handprint reader. And they use some magic woo-woo to open it. This is just ridiculous from beginning to end. Safecrackers love safe cracking in movies. It's kind of funny, really. If it gets too close to being real, we're like, well, they shouldn't be showing that. But if it's too unrealistic, you know, we dismiss it. The most realistic, definitely the thieves. And thank goodness they made a few things different. You know, you couldn't follow her blueprint and open that safe. That one's scary close. This has been a blast. Thanks for watching.